Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Museum of the American Indian. For those of you that didn't get the intro this morning, my name is Melissa Bazzani. I'm the film programmer here at the museum, and I'm hope helping out in, in the theater today for our first ever Hopi Festival. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to, of course, thank our National Council of the National Museum of the American Indian who helped make this happen, and also the Henry Luce Foundation. We're so excited and we're hoping that this will only be the first of many. Our next presentation is Gene Tallis. He is going to talk to us about the history of Hopi participation in US military service. Gene. Kakwa, no happy Gino Talas Bahan Matsua, no happy Hu and Mahopi Matsua, no happy Mun Kabin Absin and Gita, no Paka Punga. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Hopi Day today at the Smithsonian uh, Native American uh, Museum. I'm grateful for uh, the staff here for the last two days for hosting us. Uh, it's been an honor to be here in Washington, D.C. to kind of give you a real, real tip of the iceberg snapshot of what Hopi is. And we certainly invite everyone to come visit Hopi at some time or fashion in their very near future. But today, what I'm going to talk to you about today is our, our own Hopi code talkers and their role during World War II and how it led up to the final recognition at the national level. So before we begin with their with their topic, what I want to do is kind of set the foundations on our on our own Hopi culture and our history to kind of give you a real brief history on how things led up from the very beginning of our gener uh, genesis story until the modern time. So we'll go ahead and start with that first. So for those that don't know, I am the current veteran service officer for the Hopi tribe. I've been with the program for about 10 years. I am an Air Force veteran itself. I retired in 2004. I do have two staff members of my, uh, that work in my office as well, so we make connection with all our veterans on Hopi. Uh, Hannah Paliwaiti serves as our secretary too of the office, and uh, Ms. Stephanie Hayama serves as our transport driver to get all our veterans to their, to their medical appointments in, uh, statewide. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna transition to a brief history on the Hopi culture and our, our early history. And I want to um, cite Mr. Lee Kwanwasioma. He was our recent Hopi, Hopi Cultural Preservation Office uh, resident expert. He's since retired, but he gave me permission to use some of his, his slides here for this short presentation on the history. We are located in northeastern Arizona. We encompass about 12 different uh, autonomous villages. Even though we all speak Hopi, each of these mesas, we have our own dialect and, and our way of doing things more specific into nature to our own villages. We choose our own different types of government, whether it's by the traditional village chief method, or we can also, village can choose their own method of maybe the up, updated modern version of, the tri, of any type of tribal government. There's roughly 14,500 Hopi enrolled members on the Hopi reservation. Uh, we reside on a 1.5 million acre reservation located within Navajo and Coconino counties. Uh, our Hopi reservation is landlocked by the entire Navajo nation on all four directions. And the only major thoroughfare that most of the tourists will use to visit Hopi is the Highway 264 that runs east to west on the major artery. The picture on your left kind of shows you the predate eleven uh, prior to 11 AD, what uh, Hopi lands, original lands might have looked like. And then moving forward to today's uh, recognition of what the Na Hopi reservation looks like inside both Coconino County on your left and Navajo County on your left, on your right. Demographics-wise, we are a non-gaming tribe. Uh, we do not have a casino. Uh, our, most of our resources are based on the Peabody coal mining operation, water enterprises, and some of the other tribal enterprises that we have on Hopi. Uh, major employers, uh, we have a, a 500 plus employee folks that work for the, the Hopi tribe. We do have local schools, six elementary and one junior and one high school on Hopi reservation. And we do have the Hopi Health Services Clinic on Hopi to maintain our uh, health services. And then we are under the uh, uh, Hopi Agency, which is located in Keems Canyon, which is under the B Bureau of Indian Affairs. Hopi history and perspective. For those that have visited the Southwest in, the, in their recent vacation travels or on business might know that some of the areas around Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, has all these cliff dwellings that you might have read in story uh, history books. And these are some of our ancient homelands that we migrated to during our Genesis story. 
Our major footprint during our migration stories consists of most of the greater Southwest, parts of Central America, and parts of uh, even all the way down to South America from what we are told through our, our traditional teachings. Just like any major world, worldwide uh, population, they do have their own uh, origin stories. For us on Hopi, we do have our origin stories beginning with our four worlds that we, are, that we migrated into. We're presently in our fourth world. Uh, first world was total darkness. Second world was more the insects and human form, or the, the animal form. And the third world was the, finally the human form at, at the third level. At that time, we, had, we were living in peaceful coexistence with nature, but somehow evil uh, integrated into that, that lifestyle. So later on, the Hopi priests at that time decided it was probably time to move on. And so we petitioned the, the guardian of the fourth world, which we all live on today, is to come up to the fourth world. And we came out from the Sapapu, which is located in the Grand Canyon. And we started our migrations throughout the, uh, uh, the, uh, the generations thereafter when we came up to the fourth world. So all those major cliff dwellings that you probably read in the books or saw in movies or visited some time ago, these were our ancient homelands as we made our way to our, uh, as we call the center of the universe, to our final homeland of Hopi, what it exists today. Some of the villages that were founded earlier during those first migrations was like the village of Walpi, pictured here, and uh, Awatovi and Walpi and Arivi. With the story of Arabi, it split up into two different villages because there was two, according to uh, legends and traditions, there was one brother that didn't want to live with his brother for some reason, so he uh, split off and he founded the village of Shinopovi, which is located on the second Mesa villages. So through those years, from the 900 ADs up until the 1540s, uh, we lived relatively peaceful with our surrounding uh, other tribes that were in the area at that time. And then we had our first major contact with the Spanish when they came into the Southwest around 1540. And so that's when we were under the subjugation of the uh, Spanish Empire at that time. Uh, the Catholic religion was uh, thrust upon the Hopi people at that time, so we lived under their domain for some years. After so many years of, of their domain and their domination of the Hopi people, in 1680, we revolted along with our cousins that are in the present day Pueblos of New Mexico. So this in a sense was our first major war of independence on American homelands as we know it today. So in 1680, we did have a major Pueblo revolt. We ousted the Spanish from Hopi and our Pueblo cousins in New Mexico ousted the Spanish from those areas and the Spanish went back down to Mexico City for, for a brief period. So about 12, 15 years later, they came back to reconquest the New Mexico Pueblos. Uh, they made uh, a minor presence on Hopi, but they really didn't uh, bother us that much. However, there was a black history during that period when the Spanish came back that one of the major villages of Owatovi decided to go with the Catholic religion and the missionary style of, of, at that time. And all the other villages, Hopi villages at that time, gathered together. And what they did is they actually... Uh, killed all the men and the, the, male, uh, the, the male people in, within that village and they carted off all the remaining surviving widows and women folk and spread them amongst their other villages at that time. So that's kind of a dark history for us on Hopi, having Hopis destroy a fellow village, but it was only because we wanted to retain our Hopi culture and our ways. Some years later, we transitioned to the Mexico period where we were under the Mexican government at that time. And of course, in 1848, the Mexican War happened with the United States, and we became under the United States jurisdiction under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo on February 2nd, 1848. So with the influence of the Amer American government, and of course, uh, with missionaries coming into being, our first contact with other non-Hopis were the Mormons when they became their missionary programs in the greater Southwest and then later on other missionaries and then other groups such as Major Wesley Powell as he made his famous river trip down the Colorado River. Of course, like I mentioned before, currently our reservation is totally surrounded by the Navajo uh, Nation. And at that time, they were our ancient enemies along with other tribes like the Apaches and Utes. But more so, the Navajos start encroaching on Hopi land. So in the 1880s, uh, some of the major chiefs from the different villages came to Washington, D.C. to petition President Chester Arthur at that time to see if they could address their concerns. And so at that time, it's when Chester MacArthur, or Arthur, uh, Arthur, Chester Arthur created the executive order to create the Hopi Reservation. Along with that, uh, the U.S. government decided to impose the Dawes 
Act of 1887, where they uh, um, made those Hopis uh, give up their clan lands because we're a clan last clan based uh, people. Uh, they wanted them to uh, go toward the white man's way and have a lot of lands assigned to them, so they passed that, but it didn't work well with Hopis. Of course, other visitors came to the Hopis, like the, the expeditions from the museums, looking for artifacts, collecting stuff from the villages, and, and at some point, some were either taken or given to them, and some ended up here in the Masonian Museum artifacts area, so one, uh, years later, we're trying to get some of those uh, repatriated back to the Hopi people. Along with the greater uh, concept of manifest destiny, all our Hopi children, along with other native tribes, they came, fell upon the uh, boarding school system, where all our Hopi children and all native children were sent to boarding schools throughout the nation, as far, as far east as Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania, other places were Sherman Indian School in Riverside, California, Carson City uh, at Stewart Indian School in Nevada. But one of the positive influences that came out of this, out of the boarding school method, was that we did have a, a famous Hopi. His name was Louis Tuanima. He was a, a teammate of Jim Thorpe. And as we all know, Jim Thorpe and him went to the 1912 Olympics, Jim Thorpe winning major gold medals, and Louis Tuanima won second place for the 10,000 meter race. So he, we're very proud of him, and we hold a Louis Tuanima race every year in September to honor his feat as an Olympi Olympian. Uh, earning the uh, gold, uh, silver medal in 10,000 meter run. Of course, with anything, with new new people coming into different locations, uh, same happened to Hopi. All these major diseases like smallpox took a terrible toll on our Hopi people. Then other things happened with as we move closer to the 1900s. Some of the other Hopi villages decided to go more progressive with the modern way of the white man's government, and other villages decided to stay traditional, and so there was kind of like a mini civil war amongst one of the, the villages of Arabi where they split off, and after, because of that split, the villages of Hotvela and Pakavi and Kekoksmovi were created. Moving on to our Hopi ceremonies and traditions which have been held for eons, uh, like I mentioned, our our system is based on the maternal side of the family, so all our clan is based on our mom's side, our mother's side, and so when you're born, you, you, you are of that clan that your mom, your mom is. Again, 12 different separate villages with distinct languages and distinct dialects, so you can pretty much talk, tell if you're talking to a different Hopi from a different village what Mesa he might be from based on how fast they might be speaking Hopi or if there are certain words that they say differently than the way we say it, that another village would say it, we would know what their, what their dialects are. Ceremony, ceremonies are year-round based on the, the, the moons and the sun rotation. Uh, the, the majority and the most famous ones that people have probably heard about is the Kachina dances that are held in the plazas and then other society uh, ceremonies throughout the year. And then uh, social dances like just the one that you witnessed this, after, this morning with the butterfly dances and, and whatnot. And these are just picture renditions of what it might look like if you were there in, in real person. But with, because of, our, of the sacredness of all these type of uh, ceremonies, we do, do not allow pictures or recordings of these type of ceremonies. But you're more than welcome to, to witness them in person as long as you don't take pictures or make photographs and stuff like that. Kachina dances are held in the plaza during the summer months, and they're also held inside our kivas during the winter months. By tradition, we're, we're a, a corn farming uh, tribe. All, all our daily activities re re revolve around the growing of the corn because we use that in all types of ceremonies and activities uh, from the first day that you're born to the time you pass away. Some segment of the, the corn comes into play for those different type of ceremonies. Because we live in the arid southwest, all our methods is dry, dry farming. So that's the reason why we have all these uh, particular ceremonies to summon the rains, the snow, the winds, so that it can prepare our, our fields for the next planting season. And so when we have a good uh, winter, we know we have good soil for planting season and we can grow our, our white, and our blue corn, our red corn, and our sweet corn. Then we also grow melons and beans and such to sustain our, our village and our, our, our families. Again, social dances like the social butterfly dances are held during the the late September time frame, and this is where the young girls, like uh, Bruce mentioned before, that your 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 kia or your 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 auntie on your ma on your dad's side will pick you to to dance. So it's an honor to get picked to be dancing with these young girls during these social dances. 
For the girls, they do have their roles, obviously uh, helping in the household, doing all the different things that happen during all the different type of ceremonies, whether it's the cooking or preparing for the meals for the men folk. They do what they need to do, and as they grow into the adulthood, the, the middle child, the middle uh, Hopi girl that you see there, that's the style of hair that they wore, wear when they went through their grind, corn, corn grinding ceremony, and it signifies that they're ready for marriage. And that basically is a butterfly world, but that's what's representing all the rain and clouds to summon the rains for those purposes as well. The lady on the, on the far right, that's her wedding style of her hair. It's braided and then it's, it's tied up by two special cotton cords that they use when they do their Hopi wedding. And so that's her style for uh, wearing her, um, her hair as a married lady. Men folk, like I mentioned, they'll do uh, tend to the fields and farming methods and take care of all those ceremonial duties that they have throughout the year. These are pictures of some of the villages as they exist today, no different than they were in the 1700s up until today, presently 2018. So if you come to these villages, they're all the, the ancient style dwellings, the stone style dwellings that they, they primarily look like years ago as well. Top uh, right, top left picture is a picture of Walpi on First Mesa. The top uh, or excuse me, top left picture is a picture of Walpi, and the top right picture is the picture of Masangnavi, so Sapalavi on the Second Mesa, Mesa. And on the bottom, um, uh, Left is the village of Arrivi, which is uh, considered the oldest continued community in, in America. And on the bottom right is the village of Mungkopi, which I'm, in, I'm from. So moving on to our Hopi veterans, our, most of our Hopi veterans have served in some form or capacity throughout the years from, as far as we know, from uh, World War II up into the present day. Approximately 1,500 Hopis have served in the military. And any given year, we usually have about 50 to 60 uh, Hopis that are ser serving on active duty worldwide today. I talked a little bit about the BIA school system, and most of our World War II, Korea, and Vietnam War Air veterans, they were probably raised in the, the day school, boarding school system. And during that time, they were like a military style, marching to class, marching to, to different activities on the school grounds. And so they were pretty much adapted to what this type of military rigor, rigor, rigorous uh, training would have been in the military. So they were probably suited to uh, going into the military at that time. But the thing with Hopis for you folks to, to, to know is that we, as Hopis, because killing is a last resort for us, because we believe all human beings are sacred, it's a last resort when, when it takes to take somebody's life, particularly when you go into the military, when you actually have to kill somebody. So we, we cope in two different worlds trying to maintain our, our balance with Hopi religion, our Hopi ways, and of course, if we have to serve in the military, we have to abide by the certain rules of the Western world as well. As well. But we consider ourselves reserved, humble, and we really don't go out there and seek public attention. We're friendly, but as you can see, we're cautious as well because of all the different uh, issues and situations that happened since the 1500s up until today. And for Hopis, we pretty much consider ourselves defenders and protectors, not so much warriors. And for those that do not know, uh, Specialist Lori A. Piasti, well, she's one of our heroines from uh, Hopi. Uh, she lost her life uh, at the beginning stages of the Iraqi war. She's from the village of Munkopi, Bear Clan as well. Uh, so we honor her every year as well for her sacrifice sustained during her military um, period during the Iraqi war uh, days. And so we, we hope that all our veterans and military members are, are also honored on different events as well. So this is a collective view of our Hopi Code Talkers, and so we're going to roll into the, the story of the Hopi Code Talkers now, but I want to introduce each of them to you and, and to know their names uh, individually. So we have Private First Class Perry Honani Sr., Wapaptawa, Water Clan, Sonopavi Village, and he's the only one that we know of that had, had earned a Purple Heart during World War II during his service. Private First Class Frank C. Tapella, Duke Webe, Bear Clan from Tewa Village. Earned the Bronze Star, as you can see. Private First Class Floyd Dan Sr., Lamahai Tewa, Corn Clan from Monkopi Village. And the medal C earned as well. Private First Class Warren Arco, 
Kohoya Kwaptiwa, Sutta Bear Clan from Tewa Village as well. Private First Class Charles T. Lamakima Dawayama, Bear Strap Clan from Shinopavi Village as well. Private Percival Navenma, Masaho Iniwa, Tobacco Rabbit Clan from Masangnavi Village. Sergeant Rex Puyama, Sikaka Yamtiwa, Corn Clan from Hot Villa. And his medals he earned. Technical Five Franklin Shupla, Awano, Awano Tobacco Clan from Tewa Village. Private Oral Wadsworth, the Wahoeniwa Bear Clan from Shinopavi Village. And finally, Private First Class Travis S. Yaiva, Sikaya Stiwa Bear Clan from Bakabe Village. And each of these individuals also earned the Filipino Liberation Medal, which was finally uh, presented to the next of kin during the uh, Congressional uh, Gold Medal Ceremony that we had here in Washington, five days. DC five years ago, we actually were met up at the uh, hotel that we're staying at and the uh, Philippine Embassy came and gave them the, uh, uh, the Filipino Liberation Lip Medal. And that yellow um, uh, label pin that you see on the bottom right, that's what they call the ruptured duck. And this is what they gave all to the World War II veterans when they separated from the US military during the World War II. A group shot of the 81st Wildcat Division members, there was eight of them assigned to that particular uh, unit. And a little history on how they were formed. They were formed at Cap Rucker, uh, Alabama in 1942, and they went through various training segments uh, at their locations. And then finally, they, on their uh, final embark embarkation to, uh, to Hawaiian Islands on July 1944. And from there, they departed in August to the Pacific Islands to start their campaign and their military operations on different atolls and different islands. And they continued their operations through the entire war until late, till, till they finally got to the main island of Japan and the official surrender of Japan. And they finally were uh, deactivated and sent back home shortly after that, around January 1946. One of their major operations was on the uh, Palalu system on the Angar Islands in uh, September 1944. And the 81st Infantry Division was under Major General Paul Mueller and his uh, group of uh, Army Division were sent there to do some operations, and they had a contingent of our Hopi Code Talkers there as well. So they had uh, communications at the uh, headquarters level and then also connected with a Code Talker on, inside one of the main areas near the battlefield area as well. And they continued to do that and playing, a, uh, the reinforcing the 1st Marine Division at, at Peleliu and continue to do what they needed to do for the com command operations, the headquarter operations to get the coded messages to their commanding officers so they could make the, uh, the mission work at that time. And these was uh, the courtesy of the uh, Dr. John A. Boyd, command historian from the 81st Regi Regional Support Command who gave us this information on the role that the Hopi Code Talkers played during the, during the combat role. Kind of the map of what the, the island of Angar looked like, uh, some of the, uh, the airports there, the airfields they were trying to capture, and other links that they had to make during that operation on that particular island. So prior to me coming on board about maybe uh, 10 years ago, the pre, the, the pre research, pre -invest investigation on finally recognizing our Hopi code talkers came about. And I came on later around uh, that time period, around 2010, and uh, what was unique about this picture that you see here, this is the, the page that was present, presented by Orville Wadsworth's uh, nephew or grandson, I believe, that gave this to us. And it shows the circle with a bunch of names, a bunch of tribal uh, uh, members that are listed around the outside of the circle, and some other numbers that are associated with this circle. And as you can see, they kind of link up across the circle with a fellow uh, Hopi or a fellow Akama or a fellow Apache or a fellow Mohawk. And so when I got this, I submitted it to the Army Historical uh, Center to verify if this was 
something they could verify to use that they were code talkers. And then about two months later, they, they uh, followed back with a formal letter indicating that, yes, these were code talkers. So we did have code talkers that served in the United States Army Air Force at the time. And so not only were Hopis finally recognized for their role with these particular units, but these other tribes that are listed on this, this matrix were also recognized as code talkers. If we didn't find this or if that family member didn't produce this, this paperwork to us, these individuals probably wouldn't have never known or their family members would never know that they played an important role as code talkers during World War II. So once we got the formal uh, notification of the Army, we, we set aside a special resolution at the tribal level to recognize Rex and Orville as part of the 5th uh, Air Force with the 380th Bomb Group and the 90th Bomb Group, along with the Crow, Sioux, Acoma, Laguna, Apache, and Chippewa that were assigned to the 5th Bomber Group at that time. So we're very happy that uh, we were able to, to help the, our fellow Native Americans who were code talkers as well. And these are the two units, the 81st uh, Infantry Division, the Wildcat Division on your left, the Wildcat is their logo. And to honor the two code talkers from the 5th Air Force, there's their logo with the uh, B-24 Liberator that they were assigned to that particular squadron, the 90th and the 380th Bombardment Group. So prior to the Congressional Gold Medal Ceremony in 2013, we had some research and some legwork to do. And one of those things was that the U.S. Mint and the U.S. Army wanted the respective tribes to do was come up with a prototype medal that would suffice that particular tribe. And so in uh, 2012, I was appointed by the current uh, or then tribal chairman uh, Leroy Shingwe to, uh, to represent the tribe with our rendition of what the medal may look like to the U.S. Mint. And so a group of uh, four of us, myself, Clark Tanukhova, Clifford Kosokwahu, and Sharon Fridricks, we got together to kind of visualize what the gold medal might look like and uh, present that to the, uh, the U.S. Mint uh, board. So they sent me here to Washington that year, 2012, and I presented our rendition of, of, the, um, of the gold medal. And there was about 10 members on that prestigious, prestigious board, and the conclusion was they accepted what we thought would be the gold medal to be minted by the U.S. Mint and then finally presented to the, to the tribe on 2013. So if you look at the medal starting on your uh, left, left side, you do show the two code talkers talking on the radio uh, as the 81st Infantry Division. And then my input was because we had two code talkers that served with the Army Air, Air Force with the B-24 Liberators, we wanted to show something that would signify their role as code talkers as well. So my input was adding that B-24 aircraft on top of the uh, two soldiers at the bottom. On your far right is basically our uh, emblem on our Hopi flag. If you go out to the uh, Potomac uh, room uh, area after this presentation, you'll see the Hopi flag in its full colors, but in the center, You'll see the shield with the four dots representing our four migrations routes, the first, second, third, and fourth migrations. The two corn stalks on each side, three ears of corn on each, on each corn stalk signified all the cardinal directions, north, south, east, west, up and down. And it's firmly rooted into the land, our Hopi Dutzkwa, our Hopi land. And then the rest of it is just the, uh, the word Hopi Lawai or Hopi language on the top, surrounded by the, the, the logos of the uh, gold medal as well. And these are just some of the recognitions we did at the state level, starting at the tribal level to recognize our, our individual Hopi code talkers. Then later on, national, the Congress decided to uh, uh, finally recognize all the code talkers nationwide by that public law 11420 to recognize and issue the gold medals to the tribes. And, and we, in turn, the Hopi tribe submitted another resolution to concur with their, with their act. We did buy uh, two bronze uh, uh, plaques for our code talkers as well, uh, and then we dedicated that in 2009. Then, like I said, after the further research in 2011, we finally formally recognized by tribal council, uh, adding uh, Rex Puyama and Orville Wadsworth as a ninth and 10th Hopi code talker. And on March 21st, 2012, Council established Hopi Code Talkers Recognition Day to be around April 23rd of every year. So we've been holding Hopi Code Talker Recognition Day since then on that particular date. 
honoring our Hopi code talkers, and then we also honor a uh, fellow code talker tribe that might have served during World War I and World War II to honor their role during the, their time frame as code talkers as well. Then finally, on November 20th, the uh, Congressional Gold Medal was bestowed to the Hopi tribe, to the chairman at the uh, Capitol Rotunda, and then later that day, all the next of kin and the two widows that, we, that are still surviving of our Hopi code talkers and the rest of the other native code talkers, we came here to this exact auditorium where you're sitting and they were presented the silver medals. And these are the pictures of uh, some of the, the family members at the state level. The lady you see in the brown jacket, uh, that, Frank, that is Frank Chapella's widow. She's still living as well. And then far to the right, the lady with the black jacket and the black dotted uh, white skirt, that's the wife of Orville Wadsworth. So we still have two uh, widows left of our code talkers. And the rest are either sons or daughters or grandchildren of the other code talkers. And just a picture at the state level, the Secretary of State at that time presenting a plaque and signifying Arizona's Hopi Code Talker ceremony. And this is Chairman Leroy Shingwai too, uh, accepting the gold medal on behalf of the Hopi tribe at the Capitol Rotunda on November 20th, 2013. And then, like I said, later on, we came here to the exact auditorium where you're sitting, where they presented the silver medal to the next of kin. So as far as uh, Hopi tribe, we honor also our fellow Native American code talkers as well nationwide. It actually started during World War I with the, um, with the Choctaw, Choctaw tribe during using their language to talk to uh, on the radios during World War I. And then as we move forward to World War II, uh, other tribes became uh, code talkers as well. And for those uh, that are into their history, we know that some, some states didn't recognize Native Americans by their citizenship while they were serving during World War I, and then in fact all the way up until World War II, some even had that, that uh, unfortunate not being able to be considered a citizen or even to vote in their state. So Choctaws were the first to use it during World War I. And then later on, the other tribes came into being as far as uh, being code talkers, such as the Comanches, the Sioux, Lakota, uh, Cherokee. And they were honored by other governments as well, like the French recognized the uh, Comanche code talkers. The Comanches were, uh, code talkers were instrumental during the D-Day invasion on Normandy. They had a contingent of Comanche code talkers that helped land and uh, uh, sent coded messages during that Normandy invasion. And these are just all resource sites that I collected through the years. That's, for me, it's a work in progress. You know, I'm not a real historian, but this is something that I've been doing since I came on board as the veterans director, and I've been collecting all these information and facts to, to prepare something like this for the greater population. And so other, other uh, congressional acts at the state level or, or national level, and then uh, moving backwards in 2001 is when actually the Navajo code talkers were recognized as being code talkers uh, when they were presented the gold medal in 2001 by President Bush. Then later on in 2013 when we recognized all the other tribes. And so these are all the tribes that received the, the code talker medals at the ceremony in 2013. As you can see, we have the Acomo Pueblo, Apache, Assiniboine, the Cherokee, Chippewa Cree, Choctaw, Comanche, Muscogee Cree, Crow, Hopi, Laguna Pueblo, Kiowa, Miskawaki, Mohawk, Muscogee, Oneida, Pawnee, Ponca, Seminole, Sioux, and Clinkett. There are others out there, they're still researching, so we're hoping that they will be added to the list at some someday. But we know they're out there, we just need to get their history so we can validate that they were code talkers as well. This is the only known photo that we know of of one of our Hopi code talkers, Floyd Dan, actually in, in combat operations and in, in his combat gear with his, the actual radios that they use during that time frame to commu communicate on the radio on encoded messages. So as it says here, we, we, do, we owe a lot in free, for our freedoms and protection of our Hopi way, life of our courageous Hopi code talkers and all the other Native American code talkers who defended our tribal homelands during World War I and World War II. And we say thank you to those other tribes that, that participated as code talkers as well.
And there's Congressional Gold Medal uh, as it looks today. The gold medal sits in our, in our treasury vault at the tribe, so we only bring that under certain occasions because it's got to be protected by a guarded uh, security guard because of the value, but we bring it out every April during Hopi Code Talkers Recognition Day. And just for a tidbit, for those that, that are into the World War history, the, the USS Hopi served valiantly during the World War II in the Mediterranean. Uh, it was like the fleet tugboat of its day, so, but she did earn four battle stars, so we always celebrate the USS Hopi during Veterans Day as well. And some of the pictures of our Hopi veterans that we celebrate each year, men and women serving from World War I up into the present day. This is my contact information located in the Hopi tribe, my mailing address and such, but I can present, give that to you if you want it. I have my business cards with me today as well. So since time immemorial, Hopis have been around. I'm glad that you're here for the last two days to learn a little bit more about the Hopi culture, traditions, and more so the, the impact that our Hopi veterans played during their military service as well. Um, for Hopis, uh, like I mentioned, uh, killing is, uh, is, is a last resort. So we go through a cleansing ceremony for all our Hopi veterans that come back home so that we whatever they, they witnessed or saw or did in the military, we put all those bad things away, and then that way we can re reintegrate them back into the village life. It may not work the first time, but we tell our veterans to go ahead and do the cleansing ceremony, maybe the second time or third time, until they're comfortable with, the, with themselves and stuff like that. So we're, we're grateful for their, their role in the military and all, all, all other veterans that are here. We thank you for your military service as well. And so I just always like to show the picture of my airplane I used to fly on when I was in the military to make sure I get. <laughs> but again, uh, I thank you for being attentive and learning just a little bit about the history. Like I said, this is a work in progress for me. I'm not a historian, but it's just my way of collecting information so I can do kind of a semi-professional presentation that folks that they can learn more about our Hopi culture, about our Hopi co-talkers, and then to come visit at some form or fashion to witness you know, all our ancient ways, uh, the things that we do, because we're, we're a living tribe. And, and because of the legacy of our Hopi Code Talkers, they, they were under the BIA system. So the, the, day, the, the dorm system going to a boarding school. So at that time, you know, I guess they were telling those kids that at that time, they said, don't be speaking your Hopi, don't be speaking your Apache language. If we get we catch you doing that, we're gonna make you a bar of soap or hit you on the hand or something. The fact so they discouraged them to speak their language. But fortunately, there were some of these brave Native Americans that probably talked secretly after class or in their dorm rooms, and they kept their their language alive. And so that's the reason why they retained it during World War II. And those 36 tribes that had code talkers were thankful for them. And so we we teach their legacy of what they did because language is so important not just for Hopis, but for all you people out here that come from different backgrounds. We always say it starts at home. So start teaching your young kids at the early age from the day that they were born up into your adulthood, you know, your native language, your native customs, because that's something that's ingrained in your side you, something that you should hold true to your heart. Never for forget your past. Always think of the future as well. So again, this is a history of our, our Hopi tribe more so a history of, 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 of you, your history, and pretty much entire history of our great America that we all live in. Live in. So it's everybody's history as, as far as I'm concerned. So I'd like to thank each and every one of you for this, this time to, uh, to hear me out and listen to my presentation. Again, I'd like to thank the great staff here at the Museum of the American Indian. They've just been gracious hosts to host us here this last two days and gone out of their way to make things happen for us. So, again, thank you to everybody that's here, and we have, hope you have a safe day and enjoy your day. Thank you.